Have you ever met anyone ruined by success? I know I have. I've seen people who have been successful in so many arenas of life, financially and business and career, spiritually. I've seen people successful in relationships. And all of a sudden, it seems at the pinnacle of their success, everything falls apart. <clears throat> we, we've seen it uh, in, in politics. You've seen politicians at the height of their success. And, and then all of a sudden, it all crumbles around them. And, and in entertainment, celebrities, we're, we're kind of seeing some of it in uh, the life of Bill Gates kind of unfolding before our eyes. But success brings with it inherent danger. I am convinced of this, that success has ruined more people than failure. The reason why is when we fail, what do we do? If you're a follower of Christ, when you fail, you run to God and say, God, I've made a mess of things. But when you're successful, it's easy to forget God. It's easy to wander away from God. It's easy for your ego and your pride to get pumped up bigger and bigger and bigger, and you think that you're something. So we're in this series called Prepared, how to be prepared for when the storms of life hit, because the storms will come. So we've talked about things like being prepared when the unexpected happens, being prepared when you're being pressured to conform, being prepared when the impossible is needed, being prepared when the temperature rises. Now this morning, we're going to look at how to be prepared when you're threatened by success. Because threat, success will always, always, always threaten you. I don't care what the arena is, at some point, success will always threaten you. So everyone say always. always. It will always threaten you. So this morning, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 4. We're just going to look at bits and pieces. But this whole chapter is a story about King Nebuchadnezzar. So if you've been with us, you know through the book of Daniel... Uh, Early on, the, the Israelites were defeated and they were brought into captivity by the Babylonian Empire. And the, the leader, the king of the Babylonian Empire is this man named Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this is decades later. He's now in his 50s. And he has found success. See, Nebuchadnezzar, early on, uh, Babylon was not a, a great empire. It was a kingdom under Assyrian rule. The Assyrian Empire was the superpower. His dad formed the Babylonian kingdom in rebellion to the Assyrians. Nebuchadnezzar served as a general under his father, and he was a brilliant general. So much so that he led a campaign against the Assyrians and defeated them. So he became an instant overnight success. He was, he was the hero so much so that his dad, who was both smart and cunning politically, said, I am going to uh, elevate Nebuchadnezzar to co-regent with me. So they led in tandem over the Babylonian empire that was growing. The Assyrian empire still was there. And then when his dad died, Nebuchadnezzar rose to complete power of Babylon. He ended up having additional military campaigns and, and, and decimated the Assyrians. That in, over time, the Babylonian Empire became the preeminent power of that time. It was the superpower. And he was successful in everything he did. And his, he, built, he built a beautiful city. He, he, for his wife, he built what is called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which were one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Seven wonders of the ancient world. They were beautiful. It was gorgeous. The city was splendid. He was so successful. And it began to pump up his pride and his ego. And here's what it says in Daniel chapter 4, verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous, resting on my laurels, enjoying my success. Success will always, always always threaten you. So he's got all this success. So really, all of chapter 4 of Daniel is a letter that King Nebuchadnezzar writes. It's, it's a story he tells. The letter is written after the story happens. Now he's telling everyone what happened to him. So here he is enjoying his success, and one night he has a dream. 
And this dream terrifies him, but he has no idea what the dream means. Now, if you were with us a number of weeks ago, you remember Nebuchadnezzar had a dream another time. But that dream was about 32 years prior to this. And at that time, Daniel interpreted the dream. So once again, Daniel is called in. And Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel, who's one of his chief advisors, and he says, Daniel, I had this dream. It's terrified me. I know it means something, but I don't know what it means. Tell it to me. Daniel says, well, king, I, I, I'll, I'll explain the dream to you, uh, but you're not going to like it. He said, here's basically what the dream means. He said, God is sick and tired of your arrogance, your ego, your pride. You are walking around thinking you are everything, that you've created everything, that you've done everything, that everyone should bow down and worship you and worship your success. And yet God, through the years, through me and through my friends, has demonstrated to you his power. He's worked miracles. He's done all these things. And yet you, for over 30 years, have acknowledged God Nada. Zilch. All you've done is make it about you. And so God is fed up and God is going to humble you. God is going to humble you in a way that doesn't just humble you. It humiliates you because you are going to have a psychotic break. You're going to lose touch with reality. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to be kicked out of the palace. You're going to lose your position of authority and you're going to live out in the wilderness and the Bible doesn't tell us how long. It just says for seven times or seven seasons. But you're going to live out in the desert and eat grass and walk around on your, four, uh, on your feet and on your hands like an, a wild animal. Your hair is going to grow long. Your nails are going to grow and look like claws. And, and you're going to just eat grass. Because God is going to do something. Nebuchadnezzar hears this and he doesn't like it, as you can imagine. But he doesn't know what to do. He says, if God has decreed this, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Daniel says to him after, he, he interprets the dream. He says, now here's my advice, king. Here's my advice to you. Humble yourself. Repent of your sin. Stop being arrogant. Acknowledge God. Uh, and maybe he will be gracious. And he will not allow what he's decreed to happen. But Nebuchadnezzar, full of pride, full of, remember, success will always threaten you. And so the threat of his success wins out, and it ends up costing him, and it costs him exactly what God said was going to happen. So what I want to do this morning briefly is look at three, or really answer three questions. The first is, what is it that causes us to be ruined by success? What is it that we should do if we've been ruined by success? And what should we do to keep from being ruined by success. So what is it that causes us to be ruined by success? We see this in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Here's what it says. He's writing about himself. And uh, here he is, and he, this is what he says. He says, I have built this great Babylon as my royal home. I built it by my power to show my glory and my majesty. Does anyone see a few personal pronouns I did this by my power, for me, for my... It was all about... He doesn't mention God at all. As if, even if he was a good pagan, he'd mention the pagan gods. It's just all about him. He says, I've done this. So what is it that ruins us, uh, that, that, when, that causes us to be ruined by success? The first is this. When you start believing your success is based solely on you. When you start saying, my success is based on me, I did this, I'm the source, I'm the one, I did all of this, it becomes something that you're doing. It's by your effort, by your might, by your power. You give no acknowledgement to God. So it builds up your ego. And here's the thing. When you start believing you're the sole source of your success, you know what you also start doing? you expect everybody else to see you as your sole source of success. So someone comes up to you and says, boy, you, you, you've, you've done a great job building this business. You know, you've worked hard, and, and that's wonderful. But man, there's a lot of people that, that helped you. Man. It's great that your, your mom or your dad or your aunt or your uncle or somebody invested in you and believed in that. They were a huge help in you getting there, and you bristle at that. No, they didn't have anything to do with it. I know pastors who, who 
step into amazing churches, large, thriving, and it grows under their leadership, and that's wonderful, but they never acknowledge those who went before them. It's almost as if it's all about me, and if you bring up those people, it's, ooh, no, we don't, we don't talk about them. When you think you're the sole source of your success, you are, there's the real possibility that success will ruin you. The next thing is this, when you're blinded to the warning signs. So remember, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, hey, uh, God's warning you. He gave you a dream. He's warned you. Do something about this. Do something about this. But Nebuchadnezzar was so blinded by his arrogance, he didn't do anything. Listen, I don't know about you, but if God warned me that I was going to lose my mind, wander out in the wilderness, be, be just homeless, lose everything that I worked for, I might, I'd hope I'd listen. Now, I hope you'd listen. But you know what I know? And this is the, this is the truth. God warns us all the time. The Bible is full of God's warnings to us about pride against arrogance. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I hear people say all the time, God is always for you. His heart is always for you. There will be times when God will oppose you. If you are walking in pride and arrogance and a lack of humility, God will oppose you. Now, his heart's for you. The reason he opposes you is because his heart is for you. He wants you to become tender and humble of heart so that he can be strongly there for you. But there are times when you don't see the warning signs because of our pride. So it's something like this. You read the Bible. You know what the Bible says. You understand what the Bible says. And you'll say things like this. I know I'm supposed to forgive, but I just can't. I just can't. I know what the Bible says, but I know better. I know what the Bible says, that I'm not supposed to be involved with someone when I'm still married, but you don't understand my situation. All those things are warning signs. The more but eyes you say, the more warning flags you should be seeing. But most of us ignore them, and we spiritualize them away. And we walk in the danger zone of being ruined by our success. And then it says this. Daniel is speaking, and, and this is the advice he gives. Your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right. So there's the warning, and this is what he's saying. Do this. Then it says, 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. So he has this dream. Daniel tells him what to do, and he doesn't do anything anything for 12 months for 12 months it's almost as if well i had this dream i had this warning and i don't care i could almost hear nebuchadnezzar like okay god you gave me this warning but i i, I i'm busy i've got an empire to run i've got wars to fight i don't have time to humble myself i don't have time to repent Here's one thing I know. If you don't have time to humble yourself, God will make time. He's good at that. So here's the thing that, that, uh, that will ruin you, uh, that success will ruin you. If you delay doing what is right because of the comfort of success. Here he is walking on the roof of his palace and all his comfort, and he delayed doing what was right. Why? Why would he delay? Why would he delay doing what was right? He delayed doing what was right because he was comfortable. His success overrode everything. So he had the warning signs, but he delayed doing what was right. So some of you, you've had warning signs. You've had warning signs, and you've still delayed doing what was right. What are some of the warning signs? You might not even know these things, but what are some warning signs that in your life, maybe pride, arrogance, rebellion are taking root? Maybe things like this. Um, there's, there's simply a lot of conflict in your life. There's conflict in every arena of life, at home, at work, when you're just out having fun. Everything is conflict-oriented. That may be a warning sign that you're walking in a place that you shouldn't be. Confusion or chaos, everything is just confused. You can't seem to think straight, see straight. You can't, can't make, up a, a, make a decision on anything. 
That could be a warning sign that pride, arrogance, rebellion is taking root in your heart. Here's another one. When you become closed off, when you become closed off to other voices, when you think, ah, you know, those people are important, but I don't have time for them. I don't have time for the little people. Somebody wants to talk to, it's like a closed door policy. Don't ever come to me. I, I'm too busy for you. That may be a sign of pride, arrogance, ego. Here's, a, here's another one that can be a warning sign. Consensus. When every voice or seemingly every voice, every person that matters in your life is saying one thing. Don't do this. Don't do this. Yes, do this. Yes, do this. Every person that matters that, that you look up to, that you admire, that's important in your life is telling you, here's a red flag. And you say, I know what you all are saying, but I know better. God has told me. Listen, I'm not saying God never speaks. He speaks. I believe he speaks. This is Pentecost Sunday. I believe his spirit was poured out 2,000 years ago, and he's continuing to fill his followers today, and he speaks in supernatural ways. But he almost never only speaks through one person. So if everyone that you know, admire, that's God-fearing, that loves the Lord, that's filled with the Holy Spirit, is warning you, and you say, but I have a special hotline. That may be a warning sign. But we ignore doing what is right because we're comfortable. We like it. It makes us feel good. It assuages the guilt. It takes away the pressure. It makes us feel uh, some type of emotional response. Whatever it is, you ignore it because it's comfortable. And eventually, over time, you get ruined by your success. It's what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. So here he is in all of his success, and he's ruined. He's ruined. So it's 12 months later. He's there walking on the roof of his palace, and God speaks and says, Nebuchadnezzar, that dream I gave you 12 months ago, and he reiterates all that it means. He says, this is now going to happen to you. And it happened as soon as he finishes hearing the voice of God. It happens. And immediately it happens, and it says this. He was driven away from people and ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. And it says for seven times, for seven seasons, we have no idea how long that is. Some biblical scholars say it means seven years. Some say it's, it's literally seven seasons of the year. So almost two years. But no matter how much time, we know it was significant. It was a significant amount of time. It was enough that it led Nebuchadnezzar to change his ways. But it was humbling. It was humiliating. Listen, I don't know about you, but if this happens to me, I'm not writing a letter that's going to be included in the best-selling book of all time and say, oh, I, was, I, I was wandering around like a wild animal. But he does. He does that. So success ruins Nebuchadnezzar. But here's the amazing thing. After this period of time, Nebuchadnezzar is restored. God is gracious. God is, is, is kind. See, God warned him. He didn't just take him out. Nebuchadnezzar didn't listen to the warning. But when Nebuchadnezzar changed, God restored him. So if you don't want to be ruined by success, or what are the things that can cause you to be ruined by success? Thinking it's all about you, not looking at the warning signs, delaying doing what is right. But let's say now you've been ruined by success. I don't know what your life is going through right now. You may be going through a great time of success. Things may be hard. You may have had success, and now you've hit hard times. Or maybe you're just going through a hard time and say, you know, I would like to struggle with some success. I, I, I've not had that. If you'll do the things that Nebuchadnezzar did, you will see God move in an amazing way in your life. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar does. It says, at the end of the time, the seven times, the seven seasons, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. What is the most important thing you need to do when you've been ruined by success, when you're going through a hard time? Here it is. Look to the Lord, not yourself. Look to the Lord, not yourself. Look to the Lord, not yourself. The whole issue is this. You were successful. Success has ruined you. If you look to yourself to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and to regain your success, you haven't learned the lesson. 
The lesson is you aren't the source of your success. God is. So look to the Lord. Lift up your eyes to heaven. I know so many people that have gone through or in the midst of suffering, hard times, difficulties, and they look to their selves to fix it. Run to God. Look to God. Don't look to yourself. Don't look to someone else. People, I, I know people all the time, they think their husband or wife, it's their job to fix it. It's my spouse's job to fix it. It's my children's job. If my adult grown children would just do this, They don't know what I've done for them. Your kids can't fix you. You really can't fix your kids. I know some people who are still trying. Their kids are like 85. (laughs) You, You can't. God can. So you're not the source. Look to the Lord, not yourself. That if you want to to come out to be restored after you've been ruined by success, remember that. Then the next thing is this. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. So what do we need to do? We've we've ruined by success. We look to the Lord, and then this is the key. Replace pride with praise. Replace pride with praise. Replace pride with praise. The reason we fall is because we're pumped up with pride. Pride. When we praise God, we honor him, we put him at the center, we say, God, our focus is on you and no one else. So how do we we replace pride with praise? Go back to the heart and the essence of what worship is. Be with God. Read his word. Pray regularly throughout the day. I hear people say all the time, I can't pray. No, I know people who can't sit on their knees for three hours interceding. But listen, if you can't shoot up a 10 second, 15 second, one minute prayer here and there throughout the day, walking down the hallway, driving down the road, uh, sitting, drinking a cup of coffee. Just make it these little prayers all throughout the day. Listen to praise and worship music. There's nothing wrong with secular music. But don't just fill your mind with that. Fill your mind with praise and worship, things that focus you in on God. Make him the center of your life. Start bringing your tithe back to God. Start giving, start serving, start attending church regularly. Find ways to worship God. Join a connect group. Make God the center of your life. Because if you do that, it not only places your focus on God and off of yourself, which replaces your pride with praise, it also helps you to remember God. And if we forget God, we get in so much danger. That's what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar saw God do. He saw him deliver these three Jewish boys from a fiery furnace. He saw God work through Daniel to tell him what his dream was and what his dream meant. And yet he forgot God. So much so that when God warns him about what's going to happen, he doesn't do anything about it. There is such a danger in forgetting God in the midst of our success. So 2,500 years before this. So this is, this is thousands of thousands of years ago. The, the Israelites are delivered by God's hand from the Egyptians. And Moses writes these words to them, and they are so important to us today. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 8. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. Otherwise, you may say to yourself, my power and my strength by my hands have produced this wealth. But remember the Lord your God. It is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. If you ever forget the Lord your God, you will surely be destroyed. You will be ruined by your success if you forget God. I can't think of any verse that's more pressing for the United States of America than this right here. Where we are today, listen, some 350, almost 400 years ago, when this nation was just not even founded as a nation, but was begun to be established, you know what was taught in every school in this country? The Bible. The Bible was taught in every classroom for 300 years. It's only been in the last 75 years that they've stopped teaching the Bible. We've forgotten God. And I I shudder to think what it's going to mean for the future of this nation. If we forget God, you will be destroyed. Your success will destroy you. So we we need to get back to remembering God, remembering who he is. Listen to me. The greatest danger that you can have when you're walking in God's blessing 
the greatest danger you face is forgetting him. That is, that is the greatest danger. You're successful in your career, you forget God. You're successful in your marriage, you forget God. You're successful in any arena of life, you forget God. So here's what you do. When you're successful, you get, listen, the issue, some, the issue isn't when you lose the job. The issue is when you get the promotion. You get arrogant, you get prideful, you get so busy, so tied in, so invested that you stop attending church. You buy the lake house, so you stop giving. You're so busy that you stop serving, and you quickly forget God. So when you find success, fall to your knees. Listen, celebrate. Thank you, God. Praise you, God. Thank you for this gift. Be excited about it. Celebrate it. But make sure you stay anchored to God as the source of your success. And then praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Replace pride with praise. So here it is. You're struggling in your marriage. Praise God. Your marriage is great. Praise God. Your kids have wandered away from God and they're breaking your heart. Praise God. God, your kids and your family are all serving the Lord. Praise God. You're walking in wealth and success and blessing and health. Praise God. And you're struggling in your finances. You're struggling with health. Praise God. Why do I say that? Because Job verse, chapter 1, verse 21 says, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise Him in all those things. And what will happen is God will restore you. God will... Turn some things. The best way to change is when you replace. The best way to get better, the best way to find healing is when we replace pride with praise. And then it says this. To the nations and peoples of every language who lived in all the earth, it is my pleasure to tell you. I think he worked for Chick-fil-A. It's my pleasure to tell you the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed. So this is the very beginning of this. He is writing this as a letter to the whole world. It's my pleasure to tell you how God humiliated me. So what does this mean? It means if you want to see God restore you when you've been ruined by success, tell others how he did it. Tell others how God restored you. Has God ever done anything for you? Has he blessed you? Has he been gracious to you? Has he restored something to you? A marriage, a family, a relationship, finances, your sanity? Has he restored a business? Has he restored friendships? Has he restored hope, dreams, a future? Has he restored anything to you? If he has, who are you telling? Because you ought to be telling everyone and anyone. What holds us back? Pride. I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for what I did. I'm embarrassed for what happened to me. I don't want people to think all I ever do is talk about God. And we hold back. Listen to me. Tell the world what God has done. I know people that lived despicable, horrible, violent, just, just immoral lives before they came to Christ. And they get born again, filled with the Spirit. They live radically different. They're changed. And at first they tell everybody, look what the Lord has done. Everyone knew them yesterday and they see them today and they go, that's fabulous. But 30 years later, they're cleaned up, they're polished and not many people know about all the junk from 30 years ago. And it's so much harder to open up the curtain and say, now, let me tell you. Because we, we want people to see the 30 years of polish and posh. Open up that, listen, I was wandering around like a wild animal, eating grass, looking like an eagle with claws. I was nasty. I was nasty. I was horrible. And let me tell you, it's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous things that God did for me. Let me tell you, because if he did it for me, he can do it for you. So, we can be ruined by success. We can be restored when we've been ruined by success. But what is the key? What, what do we need to do to keep from being ruined by success? It says this. God's dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. So the first thing is this. Remember this. God's kingdom will outlast everything you do. Everyone say everything. Everything, everything you do, God's kingdom will outlast in other words, the most, if you don't want to be ruined by success, remember no matter how successful you are, it's fleeting and it's temporary. It will not endure. 
The only thing that you can invest in that will last is God's kingdom. Not your career, not your success, not the business that you build, not how you spend your free time. None of those things. The most important thing you can invest in is God's kingdom. Listen to me. I know this is a shock to some of you. Your marriage won't last. And your family won't last. I'm not talking about here on earth. I'm saying when we get to heaven, you know what the Bible says? You're not married anymore. Some of you are like, praise God. And some of you are like, this is horrible. Either way, it's just what the Bible says. I don't make it up. So that, that, those things don't last. Those things are not eternal. But what you invest into God's kingdom will last for eternity. And God will use those things. You grow a great business. You're generous with your employees. You provide fair, honest work and opportunities. You, God can use that to bless people, to advance his kingdom in the hearts and lives of people. You invest in your marriage. You have a strong marriage. And it's a reflection of Christ's love for the church. And people see that and are drawn to God's goodness. It can be an investment in God's kingdom. But make sure everything is oriented to God's kingdom and not yours. And you will guard yourself from being ruined by success. Make sure everything is anchored and tethered to him. His kingdom will outlast everything. The next thing we read is this. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. So what that's telling us is this. If you don't want to be ruined by success, remember this. God's regard matters more than anyone else's. Listen, when you die, listen, I hope when you die, people say nice, flowery things about you. It's better than the alternative. Um, but here's the thing. When you die, what's more important, that a bunch of people say good things about you or that God says, well done, my good and faithful servant? Having people say nice things about you is nice. Having God say, well done, my good and faithful servant is imperative. Your eternity hangs in the balance. So make sure that God holds you in the highest regard live for his approval live for him and him alone you want to guard against being ruined by success make sure you say i am going to seek god's regard higher than anyone else's and then this he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven those who walk in pride he is able to humble so you don't want to be Ruined by success? Remember this. God's power, God's power, God's power is greater than yours. His, it's always greater than yours. He is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. So if God's power is greater than yours, then who's responsible for your success? God. Who can take away your success? God. I don't care how well-diversified your portfolio is. God can take it all away. I don't care how big of a conglomerate you're a part of. God can take it all away. I don't care how high up the corporate ladder you've climbed. God can take it all away because his power is greater than yours. And so there are those times. If you don't want to be ruined by success, humble yourself. Realize God's power is greater than mine. Keep your eyes looking up. Because if you don't keep your eyes looking up, you know, God can get you to look up real easy. Knock you on your back. If he knocks you on your back, you'll look up. But why do we have to wait for that? Humble yourself. Say, God, your power is greater than mine. Because it tells us, we just read, he is able to humble anyone. Here's, here's the thing. When we see someone we know, we love, we care about, and they go off a cliff, and we see everything fall apart, and they're humbled and humiliated, it shouldn't surprise us. It does. We're shocked. Wow, how could God do that? Why would God do that? But here's what I learned. Don't be surprised when God humbles someone. Be surprised he doesn't do it more often. I, it's always amazing. I'm thinking, I, maybe it's my own pride. I, with, and with pride and arrogance, I look at all the people out there that he should humble. No, right? Isn't that what we do? Everyone else is arrogant, not me. Um, but we see all these people. And we, it should surprise us that God doesn't do it more often. But he's gracious. He's long-suffering. He doesn't want any to perish. But it shouldn't surprise us when God knocks someone down a peg, when he humbles them. Because his heart is always, always, always for someone's best. But if you're so full of pride and arrogance, you'll never be open to what God wants. And the last thing is this. It says, everything that God does is right and all his ways are just. Everything. So if you don't want to be ruined by success, Here's the last most important thing. Remember this. God never makes mistakes 
but you do. Everyone say, I make mistakes. mistakes. Don't look at your spouse. Don't look at your kids. Close your eyes and say, I make mistakes. God never does. We want to know why. We want to know what. We want to know how. We jump to conclusions. We make assumptions. We place blame. We make mistakes all the time. And sometimes when we reflect on those things, we learn and grow from it. God doesn't have to reflect on it and learn and grow from it. What he does is always right. It's always just. It's always true. It's always accurate. So much so that even when he makes you lose your mind for seven seasons... And then he restores you. you got to think that there were some people in the kingdom who said, we don't want the crazy man as the king. But God doesn't make mistakes. He never has, and he never will. And if you want to stay in a place where success doesn't ruin you, remember, you don't know everything. God doesn't make mistakes, you do. You think you know. You jump to an assumption. You point the finger. You blame. You start saying, they're wrong. They shouldn't have. I know what she thinks. I know what he thinks. I know why they did that. (laughs) Success will always, always, always threaten you. And that pride will get you right to the edge. I'm going to ask if the worship team would come up. What does this whole story of Nebuchadnezzar mean? It means one simple poignant, fundamental truth. We all know this in our head. We all forget it in how we live. And it's this. God is God. You are not. God is God. You are not. God is God. You are not. We just did a a child dedication. If you've ever raised kids... You know, there's times where kids ask some challenging questions, some off-the-wall questions, some questions you don't have the answers to, some questions you don't know the answer to. And you know what the best answer you can give when a kid asks a question and you have no idea how to answer? I'm not God. I'm not God. I don't know that. There is nothing wrong with saying I'm not God. As a matter of fact, Just about every day, you should look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not God. When you're going into that meeting and you know it's going to be tense because you feel passionate about something, oh, the last thing you should do before you get out of the car is pull down that mirror, take a selfie, whatever you need to do, and say, I'm not God. I'm not God. I have no idea what this person is going through, what they're thinking, what they've experienced this last week, month, year, five years. I'm not God. I may be going into this loaded for bear and have it completely wrong. I'm not God. You're going into that, that, that business setting and you're, you're hell bent on closing that deal. I'm going to make this deal. I'm going to run over some people if I have to because this, my success hangs on the balance. I'm not God. I'm not I'm not God. If my success hangs on this contract, my success is fleeting at best. You know how good a contract is? Only as good as a, the lawyer the other guy can hire. He can tear up the contract. Don't, don't make your success on any of them. You're not God. Let God be God. Let your success rest on him, be tethered to him, be anchored to him, and in success and in struggles, God We'll see you through. If you'd stand to your feet, I want to pray for you right now. The first thing I want to do is is ask a simple little question. For some of you, you may have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You may have never come to that point where you said, God, you're God and I'm not. And I want you to be the God of my life. I want you to lead me. I want you to guide me. I want to live by your ways, your teachings, your instructions. I want to live a life that's honoring and pleasing and just in your eyes and holy in your sight. I know I'm not going to do it perfectly. That's why I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit to empower me, to strengthen me. That's why I need your grace to forgive me. God, I need a Savior. I need a Savior. Listen, there's people who say, I don't need a Savior. Everyone needs a Savior. 
If we didn't need a Savior, God wouldn't have sent one. He sent a Savior because we all need to be saved from our mistakes, from our sin, from the way we've hurt others, the way we've hurt ourselves, the way we've squandered the opportunities that God has given us, the way we've allowed the success in our lives to ruin ourselves. We need a Savior. So if you're here, if everyone would just close their eyes, if you're here this morning joining us online and you would say, I need to place my faith in Jesus Christ. I need God to be my God. If that's you here this morning, right where you are, just raise your hand. It's a simple act of obedience. It's a simple act of faith. The Bible says if you're ashamed of Jesus in front of people, then God will be ashamed of you. But if you accept Jesus in front of people, God will accept you. Don't reject God because of what people might think. Don't allow that pride to ruin you. Just raise your hand and say, I, I, I need to place my faith in Jesus Christ. Or maybe for you, this isn't the first time that you've prayed this prayer. You prayed it when you were growing up. You prayed it as a child. You prayed it as a teenager. But you've wandered so far from God, you don't even know if he'll let you back home. It's the same prayer. God, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I want to come home to you. I want to live for you. So if you would say, I want to make a, a first time profession of faith, the first time that I, I place my life in Christ's hands, or you say, I need to come back. I, I, I need to come back to God. I need to rededicate, reorient my life in a way that's pleasing to God. If either of those, just raise your hand. I want to pray a simple little prayer. Now, if everyone, everyone here would repeat this prayer after me, whether you raised your hand or not, just, just say these words. Heavenly Father, I come to you now. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to be my God, my Lord, and my Savior. Forgive me for all that I've done. Give me new life in Christ. Fill me with your Spirit. Allow the gifts of the Spirit to move in my life. Help me to share your love with others. And live for you wholeheartedly from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome, welcome. Welcome to God's family. Welcome back to God's family. And now, we're going to sing one last song. And as we sing this song, I just want to encourage you. If you would say, any of, I've been ruined by success. I need to be restored because I've been ruined by success. Or, God, help me to never be ruined by success. Take those things and, and allow them to speak to your heart as we sing this song together.